All right, Zachary Conan here with Craig, and we're going to put out a quick little video for you today where we're going to be looking at the top 100 movies of all time according to Rotten Tomatoes. And this list is kind of confusing. What Movies with 40 or more critic reviews vie for their place in history at Rotten Tomatoes. Eligible movies are based on their adjusted scores. And each critic from their discrete list gets one vote weighted equally. A movie must have 40 or more rated reviews to be considered. The adjusted score comes from a weighted formula, a Bayesian formula, that we use that accounts for variation in the number of reviews per movie. Now, that just sounds like a bunch of nonsense to me. But we're just going to go down this list and hopefully get kind of kind of derisive, divisive, kind of gets uh, a bit of negativity on this channel that is mostly populated with actual literal love letters to movies. So this might be fun, looking at Rotten Tomatoes, because I think that Rotten Tomatoes is laughable and stupid. I hate Rotten Tomatoes, really. Those well, was between this and the IMDb Top 250, but I think IMDb is increasingly irrelevant. So, let's start at number one. Wizard of Oz, worst movie of all time, right? I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't agree that it's the best movie of all time, but it, I think it deserves to be on a top 100. I, I could agree with that. Just uh, not number one. Not number one. Um, obviously, number one should be uh, what I see. Uh, you see, this list is so confusing. I'm just scanning down a little bit, and there's way too recent films this adjusted score thing doesn't make sense the wizard of oz is fine you all know the wizard of oz is fine um i think the biggest uh controversial thing or the thing that's going to piss people off for real is the more we go down this list the more i'm gonna to have to say i haven't seen that movie that's fine that's, <laughs> that's why i'm here uh number two is citizen kane one of the greatest works of art in in the world it makes me feel incredibly old because um <laughs> Orson Welles was younger than I was when he made the greatest film ever made. <laughs> you know, that sucks. <laughs> he was a prodigy, but he worked in reverse, right? His famous quote is, uh, I started at the top and worked my way down to the bottom. Like, the last things he did were um, doing canned P voiceovers for commercials, or uh, he did, like, a Transformer. I think the very last thing he did was the voice of, like, some kind of, like, a uh, Transformers robot on a bad cartoon. Like that's that's what we did to our our Da Vinci. Uh, Citizen Kane's perfect. I can't even. That's how I wanted to destroy my career. <laughs> yeah, I can't even pretend to say something um, bad about Citizen Kane. It's a brilliant film. It's mm, absolutely brilliant. Get Out. Uh, is, number three. Is, at number three is like I don't Ooh. know a million spots too high. <laughs> Get Out's good, but number three. Are you guys insane? This is insanity. That, that is yeah. insanity. And also, if you look at the numbers, like, uh, Get Out has 335 reviews. The Wizard of Oz has 111. I, yeah, I don't get how these are, like, organized. Um, what, they said it was a super discreet list, and, like, each critic gets a vote, so I'm thinking it's almost like the Academy, and, like, the Rotten Tomatoes certified critics had a hand in making this list, and... I kind of think that putting Get Out so high up here is a political decision as well. It's a it's a nice horror movie, but um, it's not only it's this is actually saying that it's the best horror movie ever made. Also, by default of being ahead of any other one, which is complete hogwash. It should not be number three. And as much as I love Mad Max Fury Road and think that it's fucking incredible, number four is insanity. And, in a top 100 is insanity, and I love Mad Max Fury Road. That's insane. Yeah. That's insanity. It's a wonderful film. It's uh, wonderful, but four. What? This is confusing as fuck. We can almost, like, just kind of go through the... I don't know what The Third Man is. Um, The Third Man's fantastic. The Third Man deserves to be at number five. Uh, we just talked about Orson Welles, and um, he didn't direct this. This is directed by Carol Reed, obviously, 1949. One of the best film noirs ever, but uh, Orson Welles plays Harry Lyme in it, one of the greatest characters ever on screen. It's a beautiful, perfect film. We just watched Miller's Crossing, and remember, uh, spoilers for Miller's Crossing, I guess, uh, near the end of the film at the, uh, at the, I guess, at the funeral or something. Mm -hmm. um, the, the woman, um, Bernie Birnbaum's sister, is walking past 
our main character, and like and it's a long shot like that over 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 the Miller's Crossing itself, and he watches as she walks right by her. That's ripped directly out of the Third Man, so it's also one of the most influential films ever made. So I, I go for the Third Man. That's okay. another thing. I think influence should play a role in deciding these, and it's way too early to tell. Um, I have seen elements of Mad Max Fury Road in action films since then. Uh, but it's all, we're talking about a three to four year period. Get Out just came out last year. It's going to be really difficult to gauge its influence this early on. And Moonlight is an okay movie, but once again, the influence is pretty hard to judge. Moonlight is kind of groundbreaking for winning the awards and also being a queer positive film. Uh, what about Inside Out, Craig? I haven't seen it either. All right, I actually haven't seen Inside Out either. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we can't really speak on that one. I've heard a lot of really, really positive things about it. Yeah, me too. Um, But would you be surprised if it was the best Disney movie ever made? Because that's what this list is positing directly. I would be insanely surprised. Where's The Lion King? I'm not even seeing it anymore. I I mean... (laughs) If, Where's I wouldn't be super surprised if it was the best Disney made D- Disney movie made like maybe within like you the know, last I, ten years. I don't feel bad about not but. seeing Inside Out because I really wanted to, but uh, Disney likes to to price their physical media at ungodly amounts of money, um, like Criterion prices. Like I'm not going to pay twenty five dollars for a Blu Ray of Inside Out. Disney, stop making stop making people pay for their childhoods so outrageously. So I'm not really sad about seeing Inside Out. The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is one of the greatest silent films ever made, starring uh, Conrad Veidt as a somnambulist. Um, as Cesar, a beautiful, beautiful silent film directed by Robert Vine. A wonderful German Expressionism movie. Uh, we would not have Tim Burton movies, probably. We would not have that aesthetic without The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, including a lot of other things. Number nine, Craig, what do you think of that one? Uh... Didn't we see this together? We did. Yeah. Um, it's kind of upsetting that it's like one of the only movies we've went out to a theater and saw together. <laughs> it is the only movie I would think. <laughs> yeah, most that movies we've seen we've, together in theaters. Yeah, most movies we just watch here or we watch individually. Because I have a lot of problem with a lot of modern movies. I don't think they're very good. I think they're more and more disposable. It's like Wonder Woman. I can say it was a movie. That did not infuriate me uh, that I was entertained speaking by. Speaking of being controversial, like I remember when Wonder Woman came out, a lot of people gave it props for being so, um, like, such a feminist movie, and I was like, yet the main character was a, like, okay, uh, Wonder Woman is the, to titular what, what's the word? For titular it? character. Yeah, titular character. Uh. And she did play a very primary role in the movie, but, like, she wasn't the ultimate focus of things. I, I felt like the uh, the guy character was such a focus in that movie. I can't even remember his name because... Um, St- Steve Trevor, but I th- uh, played by Chris Pine. But I thought that... Um, I thought the focus of the movie was certainly on Wonder Woman... Um, I don't know. I thought that he stole the show. I do the think show, this list is a bit politicized. Saves the day a lot. <laughs> yeah, this list is highly political because we're only at number nine, and we have the the so called feminist film of the decade. We have the the queer film of the decade, and we have the black film of the decade already here. So, and I don't think that any of those are worthy of being in the top ten. Um, and I'm not saying that they're not good movies on their own. Wonder Woman is the weakest out of those three. Yeah, I don't easily. think Wonder Woman would be on any top one. I don't think ever. this is also positing that Wonder Woman is the best uh, superhero film, and uh, that's outrageous. That uh, is insanely outrageous. Yeah, that's absolutely... There's so many better um, superhero movies. Uh, many, many. One uh, of which could even uh, take the spot of Inside Out if you want to talk about really great animated Disney movies. Um, well, and that's uh, The Incredibles. It's a great superhero movie, and it's a great Disney movie. Oh, yeah, I love The Incredibles. Uh, even like The Incredibles too, but that's for a, I, they're a different subject. But I would argue with The Incredibles being in the top ten of any list, except for Best Superhero Movie. Yeah. Like, it's like if, it, if The Incredibles was on this list in the top ten, we would still be saying it's great, but top ten? Yeah, Best Disney movie ever? That's I wouldn't, insane. I wouldn't say that either. Um, Wonder uh, Woman, I was just talking about disposable films, and that felt ultimately disposable. Yeah. Uh, 
The Dark Knight, I still think, is the best superhero movie. Um, if this list wanted to be political, I would have been even okay more so with Black Panther being at number nine. That was a better movie than Wonder Woman was, and I think yep. had more uh, statement. It had more political statements to make, and it made them more accurately and more articulately than Wonder Woman did. Wonder mm-hmm. Woman was just. Um, I saw some some female reviewer put it really well, like. You know, Wonder Woman isn't a, a great like feminist statement. It's not some great thing. It's just great that women can also have mediocre superhero movies, <laughs> just as <laughs> mediocre as everyone else's. Yeah. And like that's actually true empowerment. That's good. So that's at number good. ten, we have E. T. the Extraterrestrial, and um, I think Steven Spielberg's one of the most um, kind of nauseatingly sentimental filmmakers of all time. Uh, the the child inside me will like E.T. Like, I wouldn't argue with E.T. being a, in a top 100. I wouldn't argue with it. Uh, it wouldn't be on mine at all. I, I think he's mostly an artless director. I don't think there's very much art in his work. Um, I like Jaws. I think everyone who likes cinema likes Jaws and Raiders of the Lost Ark. But yeah. uh, for, for, the, for the most part, he's incredibly typical. And um, I, I find Spielberg's films just nauseatingly dull. He's also one of those directors that kind of like, uh, he did what he did so well that everyone else decided to do it too. But that's when you have to ask yourself, like, what did he do? Like, I'm not going to pat someone on the back for inventing the modern blockbuster. Like, everything that I find nauseating about modern tentpole cinema, he created. That's what I'm saying. Like, like that. Uh, dude, sometimes it's like, you can't put a director at fault for doing what they do, but then it sucks that uh, other people decide to imitate them so much. Yeah. Because, uh, like, an example would be... Oh, fuck. Now, now I can't think of his name, and it makes me feel stupid. Um, fucking what's his... Oh, God. I could at least think of one of his movies, right? Um, Isle of Dogs was his most recent. Oh, Wes Anderson. Wes Anderson. Could you imagine if everybody decided to do the cinematography of Wes Anderson? It would suck. Yeah, it, it I, would. I but, like Wes Anderson's cinematography, but if everyone did it, I would hate it. Well, the thing I, that, I would that hate separates like someone like Wes Anderson, even or like an actual filmmaker for me, apart from Steven Spielberg, is that Steven Spielberg is the creator of what I was just saying. He uh, he makes incredibly easily digestible cinema, disposable movies that's what he does really well um wes anderson has heart he has characterization he has tender moments which um spielberg can ape those things but even when he's trying to make something as thought-provoking as schindler's list um terry gilliam quoting stanley kubrick put it best when kubrick uh and his critique of schindler's list is just still my favorite critique of any film of any filmmaker and it's just one sentence and it's to me the epitome of great film criticism is uh the holocaust was about failure and schindler's list was a film about success and that's the problem with it so we'll leave it at that with spielberg i don't think he's a in any way a mature filmmaker not that et is supposed to be a mature film but at the same time i can think of plenty of uh coming of age stories that um rip my heart out or at least make me think about my life et doesn't at all makes me want to ride a bike or something I don't know. <laughs> um all about eve is okay i don't mind it being at number 11 we all love betty davis Metropolis, obviously, with another one of the finest silent films ever made. Another German Expressionism film. I wish that... I hope we see some silent movies on here that aren't just German Expressionism, because that's, like, the go-to for everyone. And mm-hmm. I don't even believe it when most people talk about having seen Metropolis or Cabinet. And I, or, or if they have, I just think that they stopped watching silent movies after that. Metropolis is great, Fritz Long is great, but it's not even my favorite Fritz Long movie. That would go to M, which I'm sure isn't on this list, or even The Big Heat is better. Spotlight, I feel, is one of the most um, overrated movies of the, the last decade. A great performance by J.K. Simmons, but like I don't... I, I don't I thought that it was outrageous, outlandish, the amount of praise that Spotlight received. I'm not into that movie at all. 
And um, It Happened One Night is actually, uh, I love It Happened One Night. It Happened One Night is one of my uh, ultimate comfort films, um, Clyde Colbert and Clark Gable and Frank Capra's wonderful romantic comedy. I watch it a lot. It makes me feel really happy. I love It Happened One Night. Modern Times, I would have put City Lights if we're just going to put a, Ch a Charlie Chaplin film just to save face, because that's what it feels like right now, but Modern Times is great. Uh, can't go wrong with Chaplin. There's a lot of movies on here I actually just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, I seem to be going by here fast. It's just when I come across one that you have seen, jump into it. Um, Selma, 2015. Um, this one went under the radar for a lot of people. It was a good movie. Uh, yeah, I've never even heard of it. I could think of a, um, better movies based on the same sort of subject matter, but Selma's fine. Selma's good. It's not a 100 contender at, at all. Not at all. Um, so, uh, Casablanca, I have not personally uh, seen, but I do have a funny story about this because this actually just happened uh, yesterday. Um, I told you me and my friend were going around to like uh, different places like looking for video games and whatnot. Um, we were going through flea markets, and one of the... I guess you can call it like a booth or a stand or whatever. Just had nothing but VHSs in there. Like this guy was a VHS enthusiast and he thinks VHS is the best way to watch movies, period. And this guy owned 46 copies of Casablanca hmm. for himself. And I just thought he was a very weird, eccentric person and... He was just like an old man that act like any old man that you've ever met who has a weird hobby. Yeah. And he was just like, I act pretty young for my age, don't I? And you have to pretend to agree with him. Yeah. I'm down with that. Uh, <laughs> my, my opinions on Casablanca is that to have and have not to better film made by Howard Hawks with uh, Lauren Bacall and Humphrey Bogart. Uh, basically the same kind of story. It is basically the same film, um, just with... Uh, not worthy of owning 46 VHSs of? No, not worthy of owning 46 VHSs of, but Casablanca, I wouldn't argue with it being on any list of any top 100 anything. I, I understand the appeal, and I think it's a, a, a great film. Um, it's just, uh, I think it's a bit overrated, but I would never argue with it being on any list like this, just like I would never argue with The Godfather being on any list like this, I would only argue with that it's probably a good, like, f 10 spaces too low um, on this list. Uh, I, I think that The Godfather is probably top 10 quality, and that, that's not a yeah. controversial statement. I thought that was a pretty well-accepted one. Um, now, um, yeah, Godfather is fantastic. It's one of those movies where uh, as soon as you watch it, you can instantly understand its uh, impact. Yeah. Because uh, the, the great thing about watching some older movies, well, it's kind of like a double-edged sword. You can appreciate it, but you kind of wish it wasn't happening because you want to appreciate the movie for itself. But um, you, you almost feel like you've seen the movie before. Yeah. Because so many things have tried to imitate it. And The Godfather is definitely one of those films, and it highly deserves all of its praise. Oh, it really does. It's... Like, if I ever meet someone and they're like, my all-time favorite movie is The Godfather, that does sound a little obvious. Like, of course your favorite movie is The Godfather. So there, so many people love yeah, The Godfather. Yeah, but good luck arguing with it. But, it's a brilliant movie. fair enough, it's The Godfather. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing, yeah, fair enough. You said Godfather or you said Citizen Kane, fair enough. I'm not going to argue with it. Yeah, it's fantastic. Transcendental is really cliche, but it is. It's transformative. It's uh, unnerving because it doesn't even feel like a 1972 film. It, it feels doesn't. classical. It feels something extraordinary. And I think every actor involved in those films probably did a well, except for De Niro in number two. Um, his best work was in Raging Bull, but everyone else, I think their best performance was in The Godfather, uh, James Caan as the ultimate Mercutio archetype, Sonny and Al Pacino and Marlon Brando and Robert Duvall and Diane Keaton. It's actually kind of I'm looking down the list here just because what we can see on screen is all the way from 15 to 36 at the moment. 
And I'm not seeing the movie that immediately comes to mind when I think of like movies that impacted me and made me realize its influence like The Godfather did. And that's, uh, really, why do I always do this? I work something up. And yeah, you brought it up, name. man. If it's Pulp Fiction, it's Pulp I Fiction. haven't seen it yet, on, but it's got to be here somewhere. See, so yeah, that's why I'm so confused about what this list even is now, because uh, Singing in the Rain will just glide right by that. Great fun. Great fun. Gene Kelly, everyone's just great fun. Whatever. I would not argue with it being on a list like this. Great quality musical. But The Big Sick is a really is a really heartfelt and touching like kind of comedy um dramedy really starring like Kumali Nanjabi can't say his name correctly but he's from Silicon Valley in Portlandia a very funny mm-hmm. guy but what the fuck is it doing at number 20 you know and then I'm scanning down this list Star Wars the Force Awakens I see on here too but I don't see like The Empire Strikes Back like <laughs> I don't know what this list is wow the force awakens we're not there yet <laughs> but like I'm just saying as uh, like maybe maybe we're not reading this oh, list correctly like maybe this is a isn't real but I, it like I'm scrolling up and like reading and nothing about this says that it's not yeah, he's scrolled up like five times by now. Yeah, because I keep finding it kind of unbelievable because... It's the best of Rotten Tomatoes. What does that mean? It's like, it's the best of their website, but like, I don't know exactly... What does that what, mean? No, top 100 movies of all time on Rotten Tomatoes. I don't get that at all, so I'm sorry, There's guys. There's some weird algorithm going on that Yeah, if you guys sense. know like exactly why this list seems so... Um, like back Bonkers. and forth. Yes, yeah, so it it's just so back and forth. So there's so many movies that shouldn't be on there, and then there's so many movies that should, but maybe higher. <laughs> yeah, if you guys know why this seems so bananas, let us know in the comments because there's got to be an easy answer to this. Like, there's got to be a reason why The Big Sick, which I just said is a, is a really nice and heartfelt movie, is followed by La Grande Illusion, one of the great masterworks by Jean Renoir, uh, one of the, the best French filmmakers <laughs> oh, of all time. Gosh. Like, The Big Sick should not be sandwiched between. Singing in the Rain and Grand Illusion. Um, but if we're on the topic of Renoir, I wish that the rules of the game were on here instead of Grand Illusion, but Grand Illusion is absolutely fantastic. Um, uh, Renoir is a, one of the ultimate masters of film. And then we get to Laura. Otto Preminger is another great master of films. Is a wonderful film noir, if not a little basic. I wish they'd, they'd uh, kind of dived into the um, kind of psychosexual ideas a bit, bit deeper with Dana Andrews falling in love with the idea and image and pictures of Gene Tierney, who plays the title character, Laura. I wish they do- they dove into the psychosexual appeal of that a bit more um, than they did of him actually falling in love with this dead idea of a woman. Um, it, like It's on the precipice of being fascinating, but then it, it kind of just lets you down a little bit. It's still incredibly fun. I think it's like an hour and 20 minutes long. And also Vincent Price is awesome in that movie. He has a great line about like, I don't know everything about anything, but I know something about practically all things. I, I butchered it, but it's like really well written. It's a really well written movie. So it's got that going for it. But then we got like Arrival. Villeneuve is a great director. This movie should not be this high on any list whatsoever. Um, like, it should not be sandwiched between a film noir gem and then Psycho. And also, Get Out should not be higher than Psycho if we're going by best horror movies. But, yeah. Like, Psycho's... Like, what am I going to say about Psycho? It's just I don't, fantastic. I don't think that in 50 years from now, <laughs> people will be making references to Get Out. No, ma- and well, maybe, Psycho gets references in like yeah, we everything. Have, we have no way of, of making that judgment. It's just totally weird. Psycho is fantastic. Boyhood's actually a big letdown for me. Boyhood's a bit of a letdown. I love Link Ladder. I love the process of making yep. this film. Uh, Boyhood was really interesting. I actually sat through and watched it, and like, it didn't feel. Uh, it didn't feel like watching a movie so much as it felt like you're watching a mockumentary, I guess. Yeah, is perhaps, essentially but it's what it was. not as groundbreaking as I think no. Luke Ladder wanted you to think it was. Uh, have you heard of the Up series? It's a phenomenal documentary series mm-hmm. where um, I think they're at like Up 63 or something now. I started at Up 7. 
and it was based on the idea of something some uh, some British politician said of how you show me a British youth at seven years old, I will show you the future of the country. So every seven years, the same filmmaker has gone back to this same dozen kids every seven years in their lives and have like talked to them about like where they're at. And they're all the way up to 63 and it's been the same filmmaker and the same group of individuals. And every seven years you see these kids grow up. Um, some kids develop schizophrenia. Other kids like die of like cancer. Like it's the most heart wrenching thing in the world. And there's been other films where they have gone and like waited years and years in between filming. Like it wasn't as groundbreaking as I think he wanted you to make it seem. If I was going to put a link ladder film on here, it wouldn't be boyhood. It'd probably be, um, uh, before sunrise, probably put that there. That'd yeah, I fun. thought boyhood was interest interesting, but it's not like something I went and immediately started recommending to my friends or even like, wanted to talk to anybody about it just after i was done i was like oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> um props to ethan hawk he's always up for interesting ideas and uh, i think he works really well as link ladder's muse as i mentioned should put one of the before films on here and i said before sunrise it's another ethan hawk and link ladder vehicle link link ladder is great but um boyhood i wouldn't have put there um hard days night i always see on on these lists and i never agree with it i i never have enough passion to disagree with it it's not a hill i want to die on i just don't think that a hard day's night is very good or very fun and it's kind of built on like you have to like the beatles a lot in order to even enjoy that film slightly and if you don't you're gonna have a really hard time liking this piece of advertisement for a band but like a, a fucking really hard time. Maltese Falcon is just, once again, great fun, but I think it's a bit basic. Um, I'd like to see the big sleep on this list instead of we're talking about uh, labyrinthine, um, kind of convoluted Bogart noir mysteries. I'd much rather see the big sleep on here. Logan, I thought, was a fantastic film. Uh, my favorite superhero movie is if it's... It's a war between Logan and the Dark Knight in my mind. I haven't seen the Dark Knight in years, but I've seen Logan like three times in the last year and a half. So I do really like Logan. You saying that alone makes me feel like really bad about not having watched it. Oh, we should <laughs> we should cover that on the channel because it's it's a uh, it's about the the dying with dignity, the death of the superhero genre itself. Like, that's actually what Logan is about, and I think it's really cool. Uh, it's a really great movie. I probably wouldn't argue with Logan being on a top 100. Would I argue with it being at 28? Yeah. I would rather it be at 98, maybe, if I'm being generous. Like, <laughs> at 98, I'd be more comfortable with, and I'd go, oh, that's surprising, but I'll live with it. That's fine. I yeah, don't, you would uh, see it, and you'd be like, oh, cool, neat. Yeah, neat. It's on, it's on the top 100. Yeah, I'm not going to argue <laughs> with it. 98. But at 28, you're like... 28, yeah. it's impossible not well. to argue with. <laughs> I mean, and also, are there any... No, there are foreign films in this list, because we passed uh, yeah. Metropolis and Cabinet. But, like, dude, <laughs> we haven't crossed any Tarkovsky, any Bergman, any Truffaut. Like, this list is a joke. But then we get Gravity, which I also think is a really overrated movie. In fact, we're talking about... Um, I just brought up foreign films, and we're going to have Alfonso Cuaron picture. I'd much rather have Itu Mamba Tambi in which is one of the greatest coming-of-age films of all time. Gravity is uh, lackluster. That's that movie where it's like, if I ask if I ask somebody if they've heard of that movie, I feel like the only way they're going to answer it is if they actually care about movies. Um, I thought it was really popular, right? I mean, didn't it win a bunch of awards or something? It might have been popular at the time. Like, people, I guess, our age? E is what I mean? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I... <laughs> Alfonso made some really challenging films about sexuality when he was living in Mexico. And he just made Roma just now, which I'm sure is even better than that, too. He, he works better in his own native tongue with his own native culture. Like, uh, it just works better that way. Gravity is just kind of bloated and boring and Sandra Bullocky. Okay, number 30. <laughs> um, the the, the sci-fi classics keep on coming. Star Wars Episode Seven: The Force Awakens, apparently um, better like, than any other Star Wars movie. And like, <laughs> so, 
By the way, this list has been going. I'm actually surprised it's this low down the list. Yeah, because <laughs> I feel like it would be. I'm surprised it's not the Last Jedi. To be perfectly uh, honest with you, <laughs> I'm surprised it didn't go I, for that. I feel like enough people hated that movie. The um, Force Awakens, no, because I'm not a Star Wars fan, so I didn't like really like any of them, and I haven't seen the Force Awakens all the way through because I couldn't be less interested in Star Wars. But I remember when this movie first came out and all the Star Wars fans were like really into it for like six months and then some meme went around and they're like, oh yeah, it is just a new hope. But it's like, they liked it though. Don't try to fool me, Star Wars fans. You liked that movie. Oh, I liked it. I remember you I guys. I liked Force Awakens. I didn't really care for 8 that much. Yeah. Like, I, I, I don't really... But no, everyone's like retroactively since The Last Jedi came out or something been like, oh, I never liked The Force Awakens. I knew... It was like, so no, stupid. you didn't. You the Force Awakens it. was better. Yeah, The Force Awakens had And I, I mean, I don't want to go too far into that because there's going to be so well, many arguments about... We don't like, have to go far into it why? at all to go like... Like, A New Hope or Empire should be the best Star Wars movie. I don't even have to, like... Yeah, if anyone argues with that. I don't even have to defend that, right? Like, either one of those two movies, probably preferably... Any movie from the original trilogy, yeah. please. <laughs> I mean, The Force Awakens, okay. <laughs> and that was directed by J.J. Abrams, who, like you said, like, we get Spielberg, you know, you get all these people, like, emulating Spielberg, and J.J. Abrams yeah. is the worst perpetrator of that. Um, he just makes these empty, even more disposable films. And then after Force Awakens, we get Nosferatu by, by Murnau, which is, by the way, another German Expressionism movie. It's like this list doesn't recognize any silent film that's not German Expressionism. Nosferatu is okay. It's pretty good. It's uh, the terrifying monster played by Max Schreck. Terrifying monster. You know, I'm starting to think. I, I, I feel like everything on this list is either so generic that your parents yeah. heard of it or stuff you're forced to watch as a film student. <laughs> Nosferatu is fine. I actually, I love King Kong, um, the 1933 film by Marion C. Cooper, uh, starring Fay Ray. I love King Kong. It's cool to see that on the list. Whatever. Okay. Here's one. Um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. There's better animation, but I mean, but being if, one of the very yeah, first... Yeah, we're going to recognize influence and, like, what it did to yeah. the medium itself. Yeah. It, it kind of... It, it, well, it didn't kind of... It left a giant footprint. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Paved the way for uh, feature-length animated films to rake in money to be profitable. Definitely did. Uh, it, 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 it's almost like one of those things where you just see the color getting painted into it. That That's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I do like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. I don't. I wouldn't like. I wouldn't argue with that being on a list like this. No, at all. That's another one I would argue with. I would argue uh, with Twelve Years a Slave. Certainly, I definitely think there's better animated movies than Snow White. Yeah, granted, it's got. But, such... but that's like for me. That's another Godfather scenario that you like. If I was looking at a list and I saw Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs on here before okay, any yeah. other Disney movie, but, I'd be like, I get it. And this is my problem with animation is like um, The Godfather stands alone as being an amazing movie. The S Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs is almost entirely worth its credit due to its impact. Maybe, but as opposed to like watching something it, something does have to be said when, when like when I was seven years old, I guess sixty years after this film came out, I was still able to just love it. Like, it's aged incredibly well, I guess. Like, I certainly wasn't watching it thinking it was an old film at all. So there must be something transformative or transcendental about Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs as well. And so far as this list goes, it falls on the more generic side of things, as we were talking just now. But I'd much rather see things like that than The Force Awakens or Gravity. No, I agree with that. No, I, I don't hate that the Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs is there. It's just... I personally yeah. wish there was more of the animated films that I put on a pedestal. And um, I'm just going to lump 12 Years a Slave and Argo together. I know they're about incredibly different things with incredibly different themes, but um, I think they're both oh. good movies, but I don't think that they should be on this list at just all. Just to jump back to this, because it is something I can actually speak on. Uh, if I was going to replace Snow White with something 
that happened roughly around the same time and had a as big of an impact, it, it would be Bambi. Bambi's a better movie. I think Snow White's better than Bambi. I think Bambi's a great movie, and it had such a big impact because it showed that uh, a, a movie, an animated movie, can actually do something shocking. Like, sure. Bambi's mother gets fucking killed and, like, the forest catches on fire. It's pretty great. <laughs> oh, true, true. Like, that was... A, it's not that big of a deal to us now because you could look at, like, a watership down. But that would be like a that, list but... with, like, a modicum of nuance. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, we're just going to skip by 12 Years a Slave and Argo, uh, but both are okay movies. Neither are deserving to be on a list like this. And then I'm perplexed by number 36. Uh, Craig and I covered this movie together. It's a great movie. Repulsion is a great movie. It's got 100%. What is it doing on this list? It's like really great. And why is it here? I don't know. I don't get why it's here. Because even by Polanski standards, it's not considered its best. Rosemary's Baby or Chinatown are easily considered better than Repulsion. Mm. I, or the pianist, even like I don't know where I repulsion. I love repulsion. I love Catherine in there. I love I love everything about repulsion. Why is it here? I don't get it. I don't get that at all. Um, love repulsion. I'm not going to argue with that being there. I'm just really confused about it. This is one of the great things about doing this kind of list with you as opposed to most of my other friends. Because if they saw one of their favorite movies up here or one movie that they hold like really dear to them. They would just be so happy that it's on the list. And you're just like, I love this movie. Yeah, Why yeah. is it here? I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't trust it for being here, man. You're so objective. It's great. Oh, uh, <laughs> man. I don't trust it. It's kind of confusing. I can't think of any of purpose. Robin Hood. Yeah, Errol Flynn and the beautiful Olivia de Havilland. I'm not going to argue I've with it. I've watched every version of Robin Hood except for this. Except for this. Except for... It, it's fine. It's whatever. It's swashbuckling. It's good old fashioned classic swashbuckling. I probably love it. Manchester by the Sea is another powerful film that doesn't deserve to be here. These films came out like within the last four years. What are they doing on this list? I don't understand it. Manchester by the Sea is fine, but still, what the fuck? Uh, North by Northwest is a great Hitchcock spy film or um, espionage of intrigue film um, starring Cary Grant. Then we get Sunset Boulevard, which is fantastic. Billy Wilder, Gloria Swanson giving one of the most phenomenal performances ever. Yeah, I saw it in theaters. Um, really lucky. Uh, Sunset Boulevard's fantastic. It, sh it should be on this list. But um, then again, Sunset Boulevard and Rear Window and North by Northwest are super generic titles that I would never argue with being on a list like this. Rear Window is also a fantastic Hitchcock thriller uh, starring Jimmy Stewart. It's great. Battle of Algiers is a wonderful film. Wonderful film. Bride of Frankenstein. Great movie. Another great movie. We've got a lot of great movies in a row. And then Alien, I think, is um, phenomenal. I fucking love Alien. Mm -hmm. uh, and I agree that it should be on the top 100. Most definitely. Most definitely be on the top 100. Uh, Alien is fantastic. Baby Driver is a lot of fun. It just came out, though. I don't understand this list. Uh, Baby Driver is whatever. Uh, Philadelphia Story is overrated as hell. I don't like the Philadelphia Story. I don't like... Explain this to me, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> Out of every Toy Story movie, why is this one here? No, it should be Toy Story 1. And, or 3. 1 or 3, I would understand. Like, 3 <laughs> would make more sense on this list because it impacted so many people so recently. But why 2? Like, Toy why Story 2... <laughs> That's the most disposable one. It's literally like, hey, you like Toy Story 1? Well, they're back. And then yeah. Toy Story 3 was at least like, oh, here's your childhood wrapped up in a goodbye letter. Never mind, we're making four. But still, um, Toy Story 1 should be on here, uh, but it's not. It's yeah. Toy Story 2? Like, what the fuck? Okay. That just doesn't make any sort of sense to me. I don't understand it. Uh, Bicycle Thieves, wonderful piece of neorealism, beautiful and touching and timeless. La La Land, why is this here? Why is this here? Isn't it just a fun musical? Like, How can La La Land be sandwiched between... It's got the like lowest ah. Rotten Tomato score that we've seen on here, too. La La Land is sandwiched between uh, one of the finest neorealist films and one of the greatest and final film noir films, Touch of Evil, directed by Orson Welles in 58. Like, why is 
Touch of Evil was another fantastic film. Why is that here? And then I have another weird sandwich. Why is Zootopia sandwiched <laughs> between Touch of Evil and Taxi Driver? Zootopia is great, but no. No. <laughs> no, it shouldn't be on this list at all. I'm starting to just get more kind of not giving a fuck. Taxi Driver is brilliant. Brilliant Scorsese picture about... Um, about lonely male rage, about uh, misanthropy, about hating the world, about just killing everything around you. Uh, almost the ultimate school shooter movie before school shootings. <laughs> <laughs> when you get down to it. It is political. No, well, seriously. <laughs> he's basically a Trump supporter. Um, oh, wow. Seven Samurai. Uh, gonna annoy a lot of people. I hate, I hate Akira Kurosawa films, and I hate Seven Samurai. Really? I think it's very bad. Um, the only Kurosawa film I like is Akiru, which we will cover on the channel. I think that's a good movie. Akiru is great. Uh, too, we've talked about it. The famous image of the old man on the swing set. I want to watch that movie. That's really a great good. movie. Seven I, Samurai. I don't know what it is about that picture alone, but it makes me want to watch the movie so much. It's a incredibly touching and uh, life-changing movie. Akiru is perfect. Uh, Seven Samurai, and trust me, I've watched... It's over three hours. I've watched a I've, lot of movies that were inspired by it. I've watched Seven I've Samurai at least five times because it's generally considered, if this was a list of any integrity, it would be in the top ten. Um, because it's generally considered one of the greatest films of all time, including the greatest Eastern or Japanese film of all time. And I just, I don't like a single thing about it. Um, if we're going to have a Japanese film on here, I think U U Ujetsu, Ugetsu would be better. Uh, it's kind of more fantastical. I know it's set different themes, but that one actually touches me. And I'm surprised I was wrong. M is here, my favorite Fritz Long film, and technically the first serial killer movie as well. M is fantastic. Um, yeah, I have a video, video on the channel of a couple of these movies, but M is fantastic. Up is incredibly sad. Is every Pixar movie going to be on here? This is truly a list made by my generation. I feel like Up, <laughs> I feel like Up was a movie that loses its charm the more times you've seen it because i've seen it a handful of times and i loved it the first time but i think about after the fourth time i've seen the movie i was just like i never need to watch this movie again mm -hmm. yeah that's the same way i felt and i that was also when pixar started doing that thing that irritated me so much with um that's when they realized that they could make uh adults weep in the audience and just started just doing it for me for the sake of just doing it for the sake of like touching every base of being emotional and like kind of just forcing things because I don't want to cry during the first during the opening credits of a movie yeah. so I've only seen the opening credits of up because I went fuck this I felt completely toyed with by the filmmakers in the first three minutes um I, I hadn't built up a level of trust with the filmmakers at that point for them to put me through an emotional roller coaster like that scrapbook so, no. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then, um, I, I feel like so many people base how good the movie Up is off of that first ten minutes. I feel like if you were... Obvious, a, I, I refuse to watch more. <clears throat> obviously, if you take the first ten minutes of the movie out of it, it's going to make a lot of things not make sense. But if you were to remove that first ten minutes, but not remove... But I like, thought it was really cheap. I thought that first ten minutes was so cheap. And That's why look, I say, like, the more you watch it... It's impossible not to be touched by it, by the uh, ideas and concepts they threw at you in the first ten minutes. It's impossible not to be touched, so there's, so there's no skill there. None whatsoever, and there's also no trust being built. It's just emotionality yeah. for the sake of making you forge a fake emotional connection or relationship or bond with a film that yeah, hasn't earned your trust yet. I, 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 <laughs> I challenge... I challenge everyone to tell me right now what that lady's name was. The old woman who died in the first 10 minutes of Up. What was her name? Um, Mrs. Up. Mrs. Up. Right? That's I don't what, even remember the yeah, guy's it was name Mr. Right Up. Now. Mr. Up. Let's go. But like, <laughs> nobody actually know. cares. They just think they did. And then we got All Quiet on the, re on the Western <laughs> Front, which... um. I watched when I was pretty young and getting into uh, classic movies, and this is an okay, if not completely over dramatic, um, melodramatic, completely uh, anti-war film. Um, if we're gonna have an anti-war film, 
I'm not sure they have the big parade from 1925 on here or the thin red line, uh, but more so the the big parade from 1925, the King Vidor and John Gilbert <coughs> vehicle. Excuse me. All quite on the front. I'm not going to argue with, though. Um, although it's like nauseatingly melodramatic. Treasure of the Sierra Madre is fantastic. It's wonderful. It's challenging. It's deranged. It's wonderful. Humphrey Bogart, John Houston, incredible. Uh, highly inspired things like There Will Be Blood and stuff much later. Okay, number 58, Spider-Man Homecoming. <laughs> what the fuck is this here at all? <laughs> like, why? I mean, it should beat Wonder Woman, that's for sure, but... Mm, what? It's, it's a good... Is this the first Marvel movie? Uh... I th- yeah, think I mean, so. Because Logan's not technically Marvel. No. Um, it's a Marvel character, but it's not a Marvel movie. I didn't think uh, people liked Homecoming. Where's Black Panther? I thought that would be like the number no, one Marvel. What the fuck? Like, I think people liked the fact that Homecoming was a good Spider-Man movie. I don't think they liked it because it was a good movie. It's better they be were a real like, list and we're not just going through like, these are the last 100 movies reviewed on the site. <laughs> like, if it is, then fuck it. We're just doing it. Because I guess. this movie is, this list is pretty unbelievable. Well, actually, if it was the last 100 movies reviewed, you would expect to see a lot of movies that just came out. Oh, not gems like the Jungle Book from 2016. You got me there. <laughs> no, I don't even think I need to comment on the Jungle Book in 2016. Should not be watch here. It. Uh, Twelve Angry Men, I think, is really poor. It's a Sidney Lumet movie. We did a Dog Day Afternoon. Remember, we were like, "This movie is really good," even though the director is really uninteresting. Twelve Angry Men is a really uninterestingly made movie. Um, it's if you're gonna do an adaptation of a play or. Or something like that. Something that is done really well on a play. You have to prove to me that doing an adaptation on film benefits it. Uh, all it was was different close-ups of people in a room. It didn't benefit the story at all. It would have been better just watching it as a play. Sorry, Sydney. I don't think you're a master. I love Dog Day Afternoon, but not because of you at all, Sydney. Rest in peace. But I, sorry, I just thought bro. the acting was really well done. Yeah, Dog Day Afternoon. That's why it's so good. All the acting was good. And then War for the Planet of the Apes. No. It came out last year. I think if you were going to have any Planet of the <laughs> Apes movie, it would be the original one. Right. This list isn't real. Oh, my God. Maybe. Oh, my God. This list isn't real. Hell or High Water. What the fuck is Hell or High Water? <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. I've what heard that. Is. But like I don't I don't know if I've heard of it as a movie or just as like a phrase. That is a phrase, but it came out two years ago. No, that's not real. Vertigo, that's a good movie. I was hoping they'd just be salty. I don't I think that Vertigo's okay. Um okay. Four Hundred Blows is phenomenal. Uh the best coming of age movie. Also, if we're gonna have movies that just like recently came out, uh where the fuck is uh that Del Toro movie that just came out. Oh, The Shape of Water? Yeah, that was great. Uh, We're not done with the list. I know, it might be on here, but, like, I would be more okay with that. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how this list was made. I mean, I read at the beginning how it was made, but that was just nonsense. No, well, we're not there yet, but... But we're at the Babadook (sighs) now. The Babadook. I think it's just a really bad movie about, like... Isn't that a meme? I mean, I'm sure it's a meme. I mean, the movie is just a symbolic movie about uh, uh, familial uh, domestic abuse and uh, domestic um, illness. Um, it's, it's okay. It's not very good. <laughs> the Night of the Hunter by Charles Lawton, the only film he ever directed, is fantastic, starring Robert Mitchum. Love or hate on his knuckles. It's a... Uh, it's got a lot of German expressionism to it, but it's also deeply in debt to. D.W. Griffith classic uh, masterworks like Intolerance, um, because well, it even st- uh, stars uh, uh, Lillian Gish. Fantastic film, Night of the Hunter, beautiful movie. Then we have Toy Story three. I wonder if we'll get the whole trilogy on this diverse list. Yeah, that has apparently every <sighs> Alfred Hitchcock movie ever because we have Rebecca at number sixty eight, which I love. It's my favorite Hitchcock film is um, Notorious, but Rebecca's number two. I got to see Rebecca in theaters too. Uh, took a lady on a date to it. It was a phenomenal movie. Phenomenal. Brilliant. Brilliant movie. We'll never say anything about it about Rebecca. Mostly because it's half Hitchcock and half a Selznick movie. So uh, you get the best of both worlds there. Streetcar Named Desire, one of the greatest 
um, acted films of all time because you had Marlon Brando asserting himself as this newfound authenticity in screen acting, but you also had Vivian Leahy playing his foil, who is um, from Gone with the Wind and um, the, 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 the Hamilton woman. So she's uh, just a staple, an icon of the classicist kind of melodramatic acting that was the, the norm before that. So you have both schools of acting screaming at each other until one ultimately destroys the other one physically and mentally. Then we have Brooklyn. Have you seen Brooklyn? Mm -mm. It's not, it shouldn't be here. Lawrence of Arabia should, should be here. That's a good movie. Army of Shadows is really good. I wouldn't put it here though. Dr. Strangelove. Whoa. Is this the first Kubrick movie? There, 2001 wasn't on here. Was it? Or The Shining. I haven't seen either. Or I think we would have stopped and talked wow. about them if we did. Yeah. So, um, because I fucking love The Shining. I'm not going to argue with any Kubrick movie being on this list. I love Dr. Strangelove. Great black comedy. Uh, Peter Sellers is a genius. And George C. Scott is incredible. But whoa. Not Number 73? No. Yeah, well, it's apparently not better than Toy Story 2 or 3. <laughs> Obviously not. Kubrick should have checked his game. Oh, gosh. Um, then we got Rosemary's Baby, 1968. Didn't you mention that earlier? I did when I was talking about Polanski. Um, I love Rosemary's Baby. It's one of my favorite horror films of all time. Oh, here we go. We will cover it on the channel. Um, I think it's fantastic. Rosemary's Baby is amazing. Because Polanski is a master. And The Dark Knight, I think. I've said a couple times at every superhero stop that, yeah, of course, I support The Dark Knight being here. That's good. Probably Christopher Nolan's best movie, too. Uh, Finding Nemo. So we will get every Pixar release on this list. I, that, feel I was like starting Finding, to get worried. <laughs> I, I feel like if, we, if you were forced to put a Pixar movie into a list... Uh, Toy Story 1, the only movie that's not on this list, should be here. It should be Toy Story. <laughs> like, I could... I could now my I favorite. can have a conversation with someone about Finding Nemo or something like that, but sure, it, it definitely fits a lot better than a lot of the other movies that have been on this fucking list, but I still don't think it's a top 100 movie. It is a good movie. No. But no. My favorite Pixar movie is Monsters, Inc., but that's because I don't really care. I love <laughs> Monsters, Inc. <laughs> I do, too, but I, I wouldn't want it Inc. on a top 100 of anything. I think Monsters, Inc., if you wanted to say... Uh, if you wanted to tell someone exactly what Pixar is and why you loved Pixar, that's the movie you mm -hmm. should show them. Yeah. Because it fully captures what Pixar is. I completely agree. And no one on earth would argue with Frankenstein being on this list. Uh, James Whale is a phenomenal director. A lot of influence from German Expressionism. A lot of German Expressionism on this list. The Wrestler's okay. Um... So far as Aronofsky goes, uh, it's one of his good films. He's definitely a hit or miss guy with me. I like Pie and The Wrestler, and I don't like any other movie he made. Um, I don't like Black Swan, I don't like The Fountain, and I hate Requiem for a Dream. Uh, Wrestler's fine. Shouldn't be on a top 100 of anything. Um, Rashomon, as I mentioned, I'm not a Kurosawa fan. Now that you actually, when you were going down that list, I was like, I'm surprised Re Requiem isn't on this list. Oh, I'm surprised a lot of things aren't on this list yet uh, by how generic it looks. Um, Rashomon, I'm just not a Kurosawa fan, but I wouldn't argue with it being on a list. Um, Pinocchio. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. It's basically sure, why not? <laughs> this is just a why not. As selection. far as like old Disney films go, that's understandable, I guess. Uh, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly in a movie I've actually watched with you, I think. Yeah, maybe. We watched Once Upon a Time in the West together. Uh, okay. The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly is the same filmmaker. Um, most people prefer Once Upon a Time in the West. Like, that would be the... I prefer it. It would be the normal choice here. I'm in the camp that prefers The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Either way, it's like The Godfather. You're not going to argue with either one. <laughs> because they're uh, they're stellar uh, monuments to Western filmmaking. I, I still hold my argument that uh, those old um, Western films are essentially they essentially gave people what people look for in shonen anime nowadays. Well, sure. If you asked Leona, you would tell you they were fairy tales for grown-ups, just myth mythology. 
for for adults. Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> Captain America: Civil War. <laughs> that, that's a great follow. What the up. fuck is wrong with people? <laughs> Oh my god. It's not even the best Captain America movie, is it? No, I don't care. Not, <laughs> none of them should be here. <laughs> uh, Jaws, 1975. Um, you know, I talk about Spielberg, and this was one of the two that I said was like pretty damn good. Uh, Jaws should be here. Uh, great, great cinema. Great movie. Finding Dory. What people are so dumb. This is what <laughs> film critics like think. I guess I don't know why. Why are film critics terrible? Wages of fear. No, no, that shouldn't be here either. L.A. Confidential is fantastic. Um, I love L.A. Confidential. A great neo noir film. Mm-hmm. Kevin Spacey gives one of the greatest performances ever in it. Uh, suck, suck on that. Ew. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, it follows. Now I fucking should I, that be at eighty seven? <laughs> no, it shouldn't be anywhere. Like I don't like the movie. I think it's way overrated. No, I agree. It's way overrated. It's giving um, too much credit. It's like I like it. I just uh, why it shouldn't be on any list. I would have liked it. Better if uh, it didn't heavy hand its statement so hard because well the- apparently judging by this list most people are so fucking stupid that if you don't make something so ridiculously heavy handed no one understands it yeah because judging by this list and the honestly of it. the idea of um a thing that only you can see just slowly walking towards you at all the times. Mm-hmm. I did have nightmares about that aspect of the movie, but I hate that movie. But that still scared the shit out of me. It's a really scary idea. Like, that could have been really well done, but it had to be a heavy-handed political statement about fucking STDs. I don't think it was political. (laughs) Well, not political, but it had to be a heavy-handed statement about what people go through with STDs. Sure. I mean... I don't want it on a list of any sort. <laughs> um, it's just one of those, uh, I found it really disposable. Uh, didn't hate it, didn't like it. On the waterfront, um, yet another Kazan and uh, Brando venture. Uh, another great movie. Can have no problem with this being on this list. Uh, could have been a contender. Great film. Open City. Now... I'm assuming they mean Rome, comma, open city. But I know Rotten Tomatoes would never, like, misspell a title of a film on a list, right? They would never do that. That better be Rome, open city by Roberto um, Rossellini, which is a fantastic film. Uh, the, I mean, the, it's the greatest neorealist film of all time. While we're going through this, I'll see if there's a different movie called Open City. There's not one. This one came out in 46, and it is the the greatest neorealist film ever. It's fantastic. It's phenomenal. Rossellini is uh, brilliant, and he prefers real life. I've never seen I Am Not Your Negro that came out last year. What did you think of I Am Not Your Negro? Craig, I know you're a big fan of I Am Not Your Negro. Never seen it. I I never even heard of it. Me neither. That's weird. Tokyo Story by Ozu is uh, much loved, and it's uh, pretty damn good. I'm not going to argue with it. Creed, I prefer Rocky? I don't know. This Neither should be on a list like this. The Grapes of Wrath is also not a good movie. I'm sorry, I'm not into The Grapes of Wrath. That's not a good classic movie. It's just so generic, it makes my eyes burn. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, part two? No. What? No. What is this? No. What? No, 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 no. Ooh. <laughs> no Harry Potter movie should be on here. No, but I thought people specifically were kind of let down by the whole Deathly Hallows movies. I think the one that people dislike is uh, three or whatever. But I think no, people we... love three. People love Prisoner of Azkaban. Should 
That's the one people love. But should we even be having a conversation? No, about this Harry this Potter? conversation shouldn't be happening because it shouldn't be here. I, I mean, I grew up on Harry Potter. I I like fucking, you know, put on the little robe and put uh, grabbed a wand when I went to the movies, just like every other fucking kid who watched Harry Potter growing up. Uh, I was the no. same age as all the characters growing up watching the movie. No, I didn't do that. But I mean, that's fine. But a lot of kids did, and I was one of those kids. It shouldn't be on this list. <laughs> no, it just uh, shouldn't be on this list. Roman Holiday, I'm not going to argue with you about. That's a charming little film. Uh, the Hurt Locker, also not going to argue with you about it. Um, it's pretty emblematic of its time and place. I would prefer Zero Dark Thirty, but I'm not going to argue with The Hurt Locker. That's fine. Uh, High Noon is pretty good. That's a pretty damn good Western. Um Howard Hawks and John Wayne thought it was pretty anti-American, but I think that they were just a bit vapid in their criticisms. I think High Noon is fantastic, uh, fantastic film. Last Picture Show, I'm kind of surprised that's here based on how awful the rest of the list is. Last Picture Show is a really great Bogdanovich and uh, Jeff Bridges. Uh, just a really great film, really great film. Lady Vanishes, um, dear every film critic in the world, Alfred Hitchcock's entire filmography is not worthy of being on a list of 100 out of these 100 films at least 12 are by alfred hitchcock or like it feels like at least a dozen of these i've said alfred hitchcock's name on and they don't all deserve to be here i've only passed by one kubrick film i don't understand this and then we end it with aliens which if this was like a normal list like a list of like any sort of quality or nuance and he decided to end it at 100 with aliens i'd be like that's fine that's fair you've you get to have fun at the end. That's cool. I like Aliens. Aliens is fantastic. I watch it a lot. What am I going to say there? Okay, okay. What are the what are the most glaring omissions to you, just off the top of your head, that just aren't here? We didn't see Pulp Fiction. <laughs> Pulp Fiction, for me, is also the biggest one that's not here. Uh, based on influence, um, no Tarantino whatsoever. Um, don't think there was a Coen Brothers movie either. Uh, Big Lebowski, Fargo, No Country for Old Men. None, none. I not see any of those. Uh, we were also saying um, I think that Inception. Coke... We expected to see. We don't like, but we expected to see yeah, it. Yeah, we, we, we really hate Inception, but it's uh, normally you'd see something like that here. Or The Shawshank Redemption. I hate that movie, but that's like number one over at old IMDb. Uh, Forrest Gump is terrible. I hate Forrest Gump, but that's not here either. <laughs> and that would almost certainly be uh, here. A uh, movie I do love, like uh, Lost in Translation, is not here. Even um, Her, which I have uh, issues with, is not here. But I'm I like surprised Her, by. but I don't know. I would have to watch it again to decide on whether I think it should be top 100 anything. Yeah, but I would just assume it would be here. And that Especially based off the idea of like recent movies that yeah. were impactful. Yeah. Not, not when you can have I'm Not Your Negro. I don't even know what that is. I don't know what that is either. I feel like that's... I don't know. I don't know. Dude. Okay, um, well, there's so many omissions in the art house world. There's not a single Tarkovsky, not a single Bergman, not a single Godard, not a single Fellini or Antonioni. And as far as like... Uh, Asian films go, there's a lot of Asian films that just aren't here. Like, uh, I've never seen it myself, but a lot of people have talked about it so many times that I just assume that it's a staple. It's like House? <laughs> no. No? It's not? House? No. No? That, that's known for I've being some, that's known some... for being ridiculously awful. Really? Yeah, like, abs it's known for being absurd. Okay, sorry guys, I've never watched it, I've just heard no, so many that's of a, that's my a like, fun film friends talk that's, about that's it. That's a fun party movie. Okay. Um, but as far as like Akira is normally on lists like these. Oh, and a fucking The Exorcist is, wasn't on here. That's surprising. No, there was no Friedkin. I would have loved to live and die in L.A. I uh, would have loved um, God, Sorcerer. Would have loved any of those. Uh, there are just so many that just weren't here that it's just so mind-boggling and confusing. Um, Heat was a big one for me. That's not on here. Any list of any integrity should have heat on their list. Um, I love Michael Mann. And also, if you listen to this channel, like the social network not being on this list is also weird. No that's David weird. Fincher on this list. No Seven. No Fight Club is really surprising. Yeah, that's actually insanely surprising. Now that you bring that up. Yeah. Wow. 
<laughs> what is this list? I don't uh, get it. Oh my gosh. Now, in that statement, I'm not saying Fight Club should be number one. I'm just saying that it's normally here. It's normally present, along with Pulp Fiction. Yeah. There's like two 90s movies on this list. I don't know. No Chunking like, Express. Like, anytime I've looked up something, the, the you're almost guaranteed to see these movies at least in like the top 20. It's like Pulp Fiction, Aliens, Godfather. Yeah. And it's like it had one of those... Dude, and it uh, it wasn't even in the top ten. I don't think. Well, it had to have space for all the Pixar, Marvel, and every film Hitchcock ever directed. <laughs> oh my god! Like, oh, two thousand one. Like, how do you not have two thousand one on your list or The Shining? Yeah. Um. Um. The the amount of movies that aren't here is incredible. Raging Bull, Goodfellas. Uh, if someone knows how this list works. And why we read it how it way. works? It just sounded like nonsense. Well, if someone knows how to put it in ways that make one hundred percent sense to us, to where we can be like, "Oh, that's why this movie list doesn't make any fucking sense." Please let us know, because we are so fucking confused. It doesn't make any sense. This list was <sighs> absurd and ridiculous and bananas. Just it, straight bananas. It's it's almost like you were going. Through the movie collection of someone who likes movies, but also doesn't sort their movies in any way. No, I felt like <laughs> I was going through the collection of someone who doesn't really like movies, but like ha- felt obligated to just make a list of 100 films that he felt obligated to make. Like, I need to put this kind of social picture here. I need to put this movie here or else people will lambast me for it. Or I also, you know, it also has the cliche, like, I'll put Finding Dory here just to be kind of radical. It just, you know, it actually is the most generic list if we're going by this generation. It's a really upsetting list. I don't get it at all. I don't, I don't get it. I just don't get it, Craig. Thank you guys for watching this video. <laughs>